Okay, everybody uh, raked out, ready to go? We have everybody? Okay. We're going to talk about uh, indigenous microorganisms. We're going to talk about microorganisms. Um, mostly we're going to talk about fungi, bacteria, archaea, and protists. Uh, the reason why we're going to talk about that is obvious because most of the, uh, my, well, all the microorganisms we associate with natural farming would be in uh, those categories. I want you to understand their function, most importantly, their structure, um, so that you can help, you can identify them, and you just gotta know the players involved in the game when you start talking about natural farming. And I feel that this is where most natural farming training fails. Um, people, Kind of see microorganisms as uh, this kind of mush of things together that are moving around and they don't really know what's going on there. So I hope to just spend a few minutes breaking down their structure, their types, and just so you realize that there's a lot of diversity and, and all that good stuff. So if you've ever taken a biology class, this is going to be similar. If you haven't, uh, you're about to be woken up. All right? First, we're going to talk about fungi. Fungus. Fungi being Plural, right? One fungus, many fungi. They have a structure and a function like any other organism. And we'll talk about their structures first. I'm also going to heavily be, excuse me, talking about these during the introduction to microorganism class, which I have coming up, I believe, in April. And then also introduction to soil microorganisms um, which I think is coming just after that, in May. So if any of this interests you, we can talk for about four hours on microorganisms and uh, really, really uh, change your outlook on biology and so on. That's, that's the one that happened in this Monday. No, that's plant physiology. Okay, so Monday. Don't scare me, dude. <laughs> I don't have it prepared yet. <laughs> I don't have the one for Monday prepared yet. That was a long, man. But anyway. Uh, so yeah, we'll go over plant physiology and morphology, and then Wednesday, plant fertility. Anyway, structures, right? I mentioned a word earlier. The word was hyphae. Hypha, in plural. What is a hyphae? Hyphae is the filamentous tubular, or filamentous structures of a fungus. These are the branching-like extremities that you see, like in your compost bin. You see it looks like white branches. Uh, the, and just like down here in the picture, those are going to be the hyphae. What that is, essentially, it's the body structure of the fungus. Okay? And when we watch the video, you'll see an explanation uh, that might help with understanding the hyphae, so I'll, I'll let that explain it. But generally speaking, a hyphae cell is a long filamentous tubular cell with a nucleus in it. And the next cell is connected to the end of that cell. Tubular cell, tubular cell, tubular cell, which when extended out looks like branching, arching fingers. So, your, the hyphae that you see um, are, is actually one cell after the other. Okay, It's not so much a bunching of cells. So I need you to understand that hyphae kind of go in a line. And they, that's how the fungi grows, just like a root from a plant. It does cell division, cell division, cell division as it goes along. It doesn't push the same cell through the soil. Everybody understand that? In addition to hyphae, fungi make, you know what, I'm skipping sports. Let's go to mycelia. What is mycelia? Mycelia is a bunching of hyphae that can be visual to the naked eye. So that's kind of why I didn't say this was hyphae. This is mycelia. So when you can see fungi, it's probably a bunch of these rods, these long filamentous squished together into like a roadway of tubes. Question? 
Um, I don't know if that's the same word, but my city has sounds like uh, like spores when I, I took a class in um, raising mushrooms. Okay, so myco, the 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 prefix my, myco, it means fungi, fungi. So it's probably where you're seeing that. So you'll see, like a mycologist is a fungi biologist. So maybe, but as far as mycelia is going to be the bunching, branching, usually visual to the naked eye. You don't need a you don't need a microscope. Yeah, hyphae. You're, if you want to see a single hyphae, you're going to need a microscope. And they're usually clear, filamentous structures. Okay. So hyphae will bunch together and create these branches. Spores, what are spores? Spores are the reproductive propagules of fungi. Uh, because of the gametic, gametic phase of fungi, I want to describe them as like the sperm or egg, but it's actually backwards, where the fungi itself is either a sperm or an egg, and then the spore is the genes coming together. It's backwards than us, if we could look at it that way. Like, uh, where we're a, a product of both the genes of our parents, the gametophytes, that's a spore. The spore is the combination of the two genes, as opposed to, um, the gamete, which would be only having one set of genes. It's backwards in what we think about ourselves. Fungi goes the other way, just like ferns do the same thing. Uh, so it's basically the gametophyte phase is different. But anyway, spores. Spores are the genetic propagules of reproduction. That means reproduction meaning two sets of genes coming together. You can also have asexual spores, where a fungi will send out spores that only have its one set of genes. All it can do is replicate itself genetically. Not until you have the coming together of the male and female plant, you have genetic diversity, which is where you get biodiversity and all that. So uh, fungi can sit there all day making genetic reproductions of itself, um, but it wouldn't th won't thrive in the environment until it mixes its genes with another one, just like any other life form. You know, if your cattle or brother and sister, your pigs or brother and sister, just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, you get deep, you get formations and all those wonderful things. That's why you need biodiversity and genetic uh, variants. So that's so. A fungi can produce spores both asexually and sexually. And the main component of the structures of fungi is chitin. Chitin is the material in which most fungi is made out of. Can anybody show me chitin in the room? How about your, your fingernails? Your fingernails are made of chitin. Your hair is made of chitin. Your skin cells are made of chitin. What does that mean? If I told you that plants have no chitin in them, no. It means we are closer related to fungi than we are to plants, and fungi are more closely related to us than plants. So when people think of fungi, they think of it kind of like a plant. It has these structures. It has these functions. No. Way, way, way ago, genetic divergence broke off with us from the fungi, and we went one direction, and the fungi went another. But at some point in our long, long history, we are related. For plants, really not so much. So, I need you to think about fungi as like an animal. Fungi used to be in the plant category for a very long time, and then very recently got moved to the animal kingdom. Very recently, that's how much we know about these things, okay? Beta chitin. Side note, I'm working on a project right now looking at chitinase. 
as a fung like as a fungicide. What is chitinase? Chitinase is the enzyme on which microorganisms produce to break down chitin. So bacteria and other fungi will create chitinase, which is an enzyme that breaks down chitin. What I'm working with right now is seeing if I can make a compost pile that is really high in chitinase, or microorganisms that create this enzyme. And then I want to see if I can use this material to spray it on a plant that is as a fungi infection. What's going to happen there? Well, I have these microorganisms that eat chitin heavily. If I put it on the outside of a plant, plants have no chitin, but the fungus that's on the outside of the plant is heavy in chitin, what's going to happen? Maybe these chitinase uh, producing microorganisms will break down that fungus and it could be a natural fungicide. We're looking into it right now. So anyway, chitin, plants don't have them. The function of fungi, what do fungi do? They do something, right? Well, first of all, they're decomposers of organic material, plant and animal-based material. Talked about this earlier. In the hyphae, the long filamentous cells, the cells will excrete an enzyme if the cell is laying next to a leaf surface or a wood surface. It will excrete enzymes to break down that material, break down the complex molecule in which it's made out of. And then that releases nutrients into the, to the environment and actually makes more like a soft material for another microorganism to come along and break that material down further, and then another one to come along and break it down further and further and further. So, a fungus will not totally break down a material by itself. It will go in, access a certain amount of nutrients that it needs, and then walk away. And then another one will come along and go, hey, this has got a bunch of this stuff which I like in it, and then start going at it. And then there's more left over, and then there's a sulfur-based material left over, and then a bacteria that likes sulfur will come along and go, ooh, look at all this sulfur, and then break it down. Eventually you have total decomposition, right? End result of decomposition of organic material is humus. Right? Do you know? <laughs> the only thing, only creature, <laughs> alive, biological entity that can break down lignin is fungus. What is lignin? It is what makes wood woody. Trees are, have a lot of lignin in it. It's a carbon molecule that, and calcium-based molecule that will which uh, is used to build the structure of the woody materials in plants. Okay? Bacteria can't break down lignin. The only thing that can break down lignin, the only thing that can break down wood, is fungus. It's one of the main functions of fungi is breaking down lignin. A lot of times, fungus can't break down certain um, molecules that are inside the plant, but bacteria can. So with a nice mesh of the two, you can break down a log very, very quickly. So you need to have one or any other in order to break down a log or a piece of tree. Fungi utilize the process of fermentation, which is key to in natural farming. Fermentation happening in anaerobic conditions, fermentation including the processing of sugars into alcohol, and lots of yeast. Yeast being a single cell fungi. Oh my, I thought all fungi were multicellular. Nope, not yeast. All other fungi are multicellular. Yeast exist with their own nucleus, their own cell walls, and they're by themselves. They're considered in the fungi family. They're free living. They don't need to associate with them. But 
They are a key factor in fermentation. Function of fungi also is plant symbiosis. Anybody know what mycorrhizae is? Yes. What does it do? It activates or uh, replicates one of the microorganisms that can, uh, in, the, in the soil to make it more plants available for, I mean, so the plant can have more availability of the nutrients. Very good. I'll sum it up. It's a fungi that has a symbiotic relationship with plant roots. And what it does is it acts as root extenders. And it will actually build a web of mycelia all around the root area. It will branch out farther than the roots go into the environment grab nutrients in which the plant needs, bring it into its filamentous structures, bring it up to the plant, give it to the plant, and the plant will go, mm, yum, here's some sugar, because that's what you eat, fungi man. So it'll do a nice little trade. And so almost all plants that we know of have a mycorrhizal association of some kind. In the forests, trees, their root balls are only so big. But science has done uh, experiments where they put nutrients of different varieties at far distances away from trees. And somehow, those trees are able to take up those nutrients. How? Because the fungi will go further up than the tree roots can go, grab it, bring it back to the plant, and it's taken up. OK. so. That is a very, very important function of soil fungi. Remember, most fungi, you can't see it. These are these type of fungi. They're microscopic, monofilament, small structure, uh, but they have a large reaching uh, capability as far as nutrient, water as well. It'll just grab water, bring it into its tubes, get it right to the plant. Well, how does it do that? Well, actually what it does is it pokes a hole right into the root and it's like a tap with a roadway system with an in and out. So in goes nutrients, out comes water and sugar. Okay? Of course, you have diseases as well. That's a symbiosis, right? So some fungi, they're not all good, right? Some of them will have associations with plants that will kill the plants. And that is a symbiotic relationship. One of them benefits. So, they're not all good guys, right? Soil aggregation. Just like the bacteria I had mentioned, they create enzymatic ooze, sticky stuff. Fungi do the same thing. Of course, they excrete enzymes just like bacteria. So they make a sticky stuff which causes soil aggregation. Also, fungi will wrap around soils, uh, like I mentioned, and bringing balls of it together, causing aggregation just from its hyphae grabbing on and tightly holding on to those balls of soil. So you have the stickiness factor, and you also have the physical grabbing and holding factor. Any questions? Any pictures? Mycelia, spores, um, and this is, I wanted to, it's a very bad picture, but I wanted to show the plant symbiosis. What you have there is um, roots, and you also have obvious mycelia as well, uh, after they picked up that area. So there's associations between the two. Bad picture, small picture, sorry about that. I hope I'm still connected to the internet. Um, okay, reproduction, I mentioned this earlier. You. Fungi can reproduce asexually or sexually. Asexually, having the same genetics as the mom or the dad. Just one of them. Sexually would be the genetics from the mom and the dad. Of course, this happens through different structures, different spores. These genetic traits are transferred through receivers and all that stuff. So the sexual reproduction much more involved, much more of a process than the asexual. Why would a creature asexually reproduce? Precisely for 
perpetuate the light? Well, yeah, so what happens if um, all of a sudden it doesn't rain this month? And I'm a fungi and I disperse by wind. Well, if I'm not getting the, the water content that I want, I need to leave. I need to get out, but I physically can't pack my bags. So I make some spores, I send them off into the wind, and my spores are taken a mile away into a forested area, which is much more moist and much more what I like, and then there my, ge my genetics then camp out there, and I can spread from there and do a little sexual jobby if you want to. So it's more like uh, keeping your genetics alive, yeah, and being able for you to pack your bags and get the hell out and still be the same, the same genetics. Okay? Spores are produced. How do fungi find each other sexually? Just like insects do, they produce pheromones. And don't be so naive to think that we don't produce pheromones. Yeah, we're the only creatures on the planet that don't produce pheromones, right? So pheromones, fungi will release. Hey, I'm ready to go. Anybody wanna wanna hook up? And they'll wait for partner to create a filamentous structure, one cell after the other to meet up, and then they go through sexual reproduction. Okay. And we gotta talk about dispersal. Dispersal in reproduction. Fungi generally will get their asexual or sexual spores out there by wind the most commonly dispersed, also through water. And finally, through contact. So some fungi make a sticky ooze that has their spores in it, and they attach it to a worm or a bird or a tractor tire or whatever, and then it spreads wherever it wants to go. Okay, so there's many ways it can get out there. Um, Sometimes the fruiting body itself will just break off and roll down the hill. I mean, there's plenty of mushrooms in the forest that will come up and then detach and then wait for wind or something to roll the mushroom down the hill. So that's, that's another way of dispersal as well. Um, types. Remember I mentioned that uh, one of their functions is decomposing? Well, decomposing fungi are called saprophytes. Means they eat death. This is a key factor in soil production. Got to remember when we're talking about soil microorganisms, there's ones out there that are pathogenic, ones out there that are beneficial, and most of them are benign under this category. And their main function is decomposition or saprophytes. It's also a key factor in mineralization. So in order for nutrients to be available to plants from the rocks or the organic material, you need decomposition, you need it through fungi. Activity. There's mutualists, which have relationships with plants, okay? I mentioned the mycorrhizae. So that's gonna have an association with plants' roots. And that, that little insert that I was talking about, the in and out, that's called the haustoria. The haustoria is that flow in and out. In the area where it flows in and out. And of course there are predators and parasites. I don't have, oh yeah, I do. Yeah, so mutualist. Essentially, that's a mutualist as well, right? Predators and parasites, somebody's benefiting. And what we got down here, what's this? Spores. Those are spores coming off the sexual structure of fungi. So when spores are produced, they're produced all kinds of ways. Sometimes they're the sexual structure is a cup, little microscopic cup, and the little spores will be placed in there like eggs, and it waits for water to come along and splash them out of the little cup. Sometimes 
They come out in long rods like this, and they have little microscopic hairs waiting for the wind to grab them and take them away. Sometimes they're shaped in a kind of a parachute type shape so that the wind will come and grab them. All kinds of different forms. There are all different ways in which the spores exist. Depending on what type of fungi they are, they're usually put in a category based upon their sexual structure. So that's how most mycologists will distinguish one from the other, is how do they reproduce. That is an SEM picture of a colloid, which is a microscopic ball of soil less than two nanometers across. And what is wrapped all the way around that ball of soil? Fungi. Those are the hyphae. Hyphae completely webbed around the ball of soil. Can you imagine if every ball of soil in the environment looks like this? Talk about lack of soil erosion and retention of moisture. And so this ball of soil is going to certainly be in an area high in organic matter and a healthy soil. You see, everybody understand what you're looking at here? Okay. There's another one. I feed. I feed going across. I'll mat it together over there. What is that? Is that on the high feet, the little rods right there? What are those? It's bacteria. Bacteria on the high feet. Okay. So when scientists study fungus, and they study bacteria, and they don't look at their associations, and I show them pictures like this, and you tell me that they don't have some sort of relationship? It's like, where are you looking? Are you <laughs> what they're doing is they're looking like a 20th century scientist, isolating the one species and looking what it does by itself. Okay? They failed the colony. <laughs> I got a couple links. I hope my uh, my wireless is working here. Oops. 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 Can you guys see that okay? Yeah. Okay, what we're looking at here is a computer model of a square centimeter of soil. The yellow is the soil. The blue is the hyphae of a fungi associated with that ball of soil. You should realize the relationship that the fungi have with the soil. Essentially their home, it's their condominium, it's their nutrient source, it means everything to them. But I want you to also realize, <laughs> as we go deeper and deeper into that ball of soil, how much hyphae are we talking about here? And in a few seconds, they're going to completely take the soil out, and we're going to look at just the webbing of the hyphae. It's really amazing uh, how they were able to map this using lasers. So here, we just took the soil away, and we're looking at, this is a square centimeter of soil. How much height is in there? I think they pull away. I'm trying to figure out what the square centimeter look like. Quarter of an inch, quarter of an inch. Third of an inch. So it just keeps going on and on and on. So, when you look at your soil, of course people in the soil class have stopped looking at their soil as something that is not completely alive. You need to look at it as if it is a condominium, it's a house for biological diversity. Okay? 
Right? It's alive. I didn't even show you the images of the bacteria yet. This is just associations there. Great, right? Um, computer simulation of fungi in soil. Oh, I'm sorry, that was one millimeter, not one square. It says up there, fungi, one millimeter of soil, not one square centimeter. So 100 times smaller than what we were just talking about. It's microscopic, right? That's what we're talking about, soil surface. All the hyphae that's in there. We're identifying the fungi right there in green. And releasing CO2, as well as the um, bacteria does the same. So when a soil scientist looks at a ball of soil under a microscope, this is what we see. It looks like bird's nest netting from all the fungi. We look at some um, reproductive structures. This is time lapse of fungi. This is going to be like macrostructure fungi. Generally speaking, this is just a zoomed in camera hitting this. Um, remember, most fungi needs, you need a microscope to see. But I think this is uh, the fungi sporing out. So it sends these long things up, and it waits for wind to grab those propagules, those little spores on top. to blow it away to the next location. You might know what you were just looking at? Powdery mildew, which is a big problem for a lot of people. Powdery mildew, you gotta understand it all has to do with airflow. If you correct your airflow situation, um, a reduction in airflow will cause this situation. If you increase your airflow, uh, all those spores will blast off out of your out of your environment, and um, they only do well when they land, multiple ones land in the same area. So if you disperse it, you got enough air movement, then um, then you can really do that here. Uh, so the spacing is important in the tower. And I hope this works. This is just a side job. This is the coolest. Oh, you gotta work. This is the coolest fungi I've ever seen. See if I can count. Come on, you. This always happens.
Sorry, get it. It's just that I think it's I think it's Bing is just not working right now. Yeah, yeah that's the one. This guy found this fungus uh, somewhere in South America, and when you tap it, it reacts with these, with these frilly things, right? And you can obviously see there's spores everywhere. Never been identified. Just, just an idea of like, the diversity that's out there. Fungi, you learned about the structures, reproduction, so now you have a better idea of what we're talking about. Now we're going to talk about bacteria and archaea. Structures. First of all, they're known as prokaryotes. Prokaryotes meaning they do not have a nucleus. Most cells that are part of a macrostructure, or something like our cells, being that we're all one animal, right? Those are going to have cells to them. Fungi has a, I'm oh, sorry, has a nucleus to them. Fungi has a nucleus in each cell. Bacteria is a single-celled organism. It does not have a nucleus. This happened a long time ago when there was divergence. It has a cell envelope, which is an inner casing cytoplasmic membrane, it has a cytoplasmic region, which would be like an outer coating, and then also that is included is the capsule as well, which is uh, essentially protein on the outside of the structure, and it also has appendages. Why, does, why do bacteria have appendages? They can move, yeah, motile, so it can move. So they usually have flagella, flagellum, um, arpillus, which are gonna be little hairs, or like a little sperm-like tail. Sometimes they have one at each end, sometimes they have multiple tails. Sometimes it looks, you look at them and you go, who invented this thing? It's swirling around in circles. There's no idea where it's going. Well, it's mode of transportation through evolution they figured is to spin in circles. You know, like whatever they've come up with, right? 
So they all have different appendages and different sizes and different structures. What are archaea versus bacteria? Well, essentially, archaea have been put in their own category, and archaea are bacteria or bacteria-like creatures that live in extreme environments. At least that's what we used to think, because now we're finding archaea in the soil and in environments that are not extreme. Sometimes these are called extremophiles because they consume minerals in ex extreme environments. We're now discovering that there are archaea in soil. We're now are discovering that these archaea actually play a role in soil development and plant health. That's about as much as we know about it because it's such a new thing. They just diverged it out of the category of bacteria. So very similar in structure and function, which is why I put them together, but you have to realize that archaea are being different than bacteria. There was an evolutionary divergence at some time. Okay? They are generally decomposers, saprophytes. They produce soil and they do uh, mineralization. For example, um, aspergillus, which is a bacteria, will mineralize, um, I believe, sulfur. Don't quote me on that one. But there's also the methanogens, um, which will break down methane, uh, which is pretty complex and, and hard to break down. So um, essentially, bacteria have the ability to break down almost anything that exists on the planet. There is, if there exists something on the planet, even if it's man-made and it's most complex carbon molecule out there, there is a microorganism that, or a bacteria that can break it down. So that's their main function is, is decomposition or decomposing. Of course, there's mutualists like rhizobium, which are nitrogen fixing. So some plants, don't want to work too hard for their nitrogen. Legumes do this, koa trees do this, several other species. And what they do is these plants will actually create a structure in their roots. So they make nodules, they're little balls, like little tumors on the sides of the roots. And what they do is they, they're a special structure where they will house a specific kind of bacteria that the plant will then take up nitrogen gas from the environment through its stomata, which are the holes in the bottom of the leaf. We went through that. Stomata absorb the nitrogen gas, bring it through the plant structure and into these special nodules. N2 gas. N2 gas has got two nitrogen molecules. They're bonded together by a triple bond. If you know anything about chemistry, triple bond means it's really, really, really hard to separate those two molecules. So nitrogen can't exist in the air by itself, nitrogen gas. It has to bond with itself, another nitrogen. And when that happens, they're held together by one of the strongest forces in nature. What is the one thing in the world that can break that? Bacteria. Bacteria can take an NO2 molecule that is given to it by the plant. This bacteria is in this little structure waiting for the N2 molecule to come down. As soon as it gets it, it will break it in half, consume some of the nitrogen, and give some of the nitrogen to the plant. Directly, right back into the vascular system. So a plant can essentially, if it makes these areas in its roots, and it has the ability to do so. Most legumes and several other plants have these associations. They can pump in NO2 gas from their leaves and get nitrogen, plant obtainable nitrogen directly from that, which is very hard to do in nature. Usually, there are nitrogen fixing bacteria that live out in the soil away from plants that also have this ability, but they have to work much, much, much harder than the ones that have this gift-wrapped little area and it's kind of just trickled down fed. So it's kind of a really, really easy relationship. It's easy to understand why they exist. 
So the bacteria get something, the plants get something. It's kind of like the mycorrhizae, but with bacteria. And the reason why it's so important is nitrogen is impossible to get in nature unless you're in an area of high organic matter. But these plants don't need that. They can actually get the nitrogen from the air. Okay? Just like we make nitrogen gas or nitrogen fertilizers from nitrogen gas in the air using fossil fuels, they have the same ability to do so without burning fossil fuels. There's plenty of people looking at how they do that because we need to learn how to do that, right? Same type of situation. We have no idea how chlorophyll works, right? We're not able to produce energy. It's, it's one of those situations where the plant just has it all figured out and we haven't even gotten close to that. Um, plant animal pathogens. Yes, definitely. There are plenty of pathogens out there that are bacteria. Uh, not that we know about as far as archaea. They kind of have their own agenda, archaea. But bacteria is certainly uh, uh, possible for pathogens. Um, lithotrophs, meaning they will consume the they will consume the hardest to attain material first. And then the next hardest to attain material for second, and then trickle down from that way. So they always have a tropism, like a, a series of, of materials that they'll go to first, and then they'll, once the, which is usually nitrogen. So they'll usually go to the nitrogen first. Once all the nitrogen is consumed, they'll go for uh, another molecule, usually a different set of, of bacteria. But either way, there's like these kind of hierarchy of what is available in the environment. The more limited it is in the environment, like nitrogen, the faster these things go for it. They, of course, call, cause soil aggregation, as we mentioned earlier. So we have those that sticky ooze, and it causes soils to stick together because of their enzymatic ooze. Reproduction. All bacteria and archaea replicate asexually. They do not need another bacteria to reproduce. They reproduce by a thing called binary fission. Binary fission is essentially just cell division. And when the cells don't have a nucleus, that makes it much easier to divide. There's also budding, which is very similar to cell division I don't want to confuse anybody, but it's essentially the same thing. And in reproduction, pretty much all phases of bacterial function, you need water. Water is necessary for reproduction and for it to do its metabolic activity. So usually in environments that are highly moist, and moist soils and stuff, you have high bacteria. Versus if it was a drier soil, you'd have much more fungi than you would have. There's many types. There's the coccus, the bacillus, the vibrio, the spirillium, and the spirocytes. They all have different shapes to them, giving them different function. So rod-shaped ones versus round-shaped ones generally have similar functions. The rod-shaped ones kind of have the same gig in life. The round ones kind of have the same gig in life, which basically means that they have some sort of relationship of their function based upon their structure. Spirillium, usually pathogens, a lot of pathogens, spirillium. Spiral, they're not quite corkscrew shaped, they're more like a, oh yeah, more like a spring. Corkscrew being a little more stretched out. They're more like a spring, tightly wound. How do they get around? They spin. And they're able to launch through water like a speedboat, which is why pathogens, brilliant, great place for a pathogen to be, super fast, being able to get around really fast. So a lot of the pathogens are spirulium. Okay. What is that? It's bacteria on a hyphae. Another 
situation where I'm stressing to you that <laughs> scientists are not looking at the associations of these two. How much more associated can you get than, like in this picture? That bacteria is obviously using the, the hyphae as a nutrient source. Anyway. I like being one of the only ones looking. Binary fission, let's take a look at that. This is the reproduction of bacteria. bacteria reproduce very simply and rapidly by doubling their contents and splitting in two. Just one bacterium, dividing every 20 minutes, could produce nearly 5,000 billion billion bacteria in one day. Hey, 5,000 billion billion in one day just by binary fusion. Hey, it was just two to begin with. So you see the potential for uh, massive growth, right, and, and spreading of, of bacteria. When each one of those 500 billion billions can make another 500 billion billions, it's, it's impressive. All within a 24 hour period. Where do you Beneficial bacteria, it's affect the leaf surface. I love this one. I use this in my other presentation. You know what? You can't really see it. It's still too bright in here. So it just went whoop, just went in, whoop, that one went in, gone. Another one. Do you see the red dots? Red dots being beneficial bacteria. Look at the pathogenic, look at how far away they stay. They don't want to have anything to do with that hole. It's just sitting there spinning, just not knowing what to do. Right? So there's communication there. What a communication is going on? Are they sending out pheromones? Are they sending out chemical triggers? We don't know. But we do know that there are beneficial bacteria and they're pathogenic. 
And if we can boost the levels of beneficial bacteria, then things like this can happen. I mean, imagine if you have little soldiers on every little hole all over your plant, and all it took was one application of a bacteria. What happens if that bacteria is available in your environment? You know, why wouldn't you put that on your plant? Protists. Remember I said they're very similar to bacteria. I just definitely want to keep them in their own category. Why are they in their own category? Yes, they have a nucleus. You can't have things that have a nucleus and ones that don't have a nucleus in the same category. No. Totally different structure. They have flagellum. Remember I said flagellum is like a little sperm tail, a little thing that motiles it around. It's its form of transportation. This is what makes them unique. Some of, well, some of them unique. Some of them have chloroplasts or cyanobacteria. That means they're able to produce energy from the sun. Okay? They're like a bacteria that can produce energy from the sun. They're not a plant, but they have chloroplasts. Wouldn't this give you an indication of maybe a precursor to plants? It's a good chance plants came from protista. Function. Decomposition. When it decomposes things, it produces enzymes. So enzyme production, which of course releases nutrients into the environment for plants to uptake. It's also a food source for a lot of macro-organisms uh, and also nematodes, which are considered microorganisms. So a lot of nematodes eat protista. You bring in a lot of beneficial nematodes, they start protecting the roots of their plant. Um, they have plenty to eat, then uh, you have a nice symbiotic relationship. They produce asexually through binary fission, and also sexually with gametes and zygotes like fungi. So if it wants to spread its genes, it can act like a fungi and spread its genes. So just like fungi, if it gets in a situation, um, it can start reproducing asexually. The issue is, a fungi, when it produces asexual, can create a spore and then send its genetics out of the environment, right? Well you'd have to go through an awful lot of binary vision for that, to escape the environment. So it's usually just a factor of there's too many genes that are similar in an environment when a protista will go into sexual reproduction. It keeps running into its neighbor and it's like, hey, you're my cousin, hey, you're my cousin, hey, you're my cousin, and we need to change. So then it'll find, source, another protista. It produces spores like fungi when it does sexually reproduce. There's protozoans. Everybody heard that before? The protozoans, they're animal-like. We'll see some in a second. Why are they animal-like? It means they feed on other creatures. They will actually feed on other creatures. Consuming them completely. There's also algae. Our protists. So algae in the ocean and the algae we find in the soil solution, all the same. Algae are not plants. Even the long algae and the, the seaweed we see in the ocean, it's not a plant. It looks like a plant. It's not. It's plant-like. The structures are very different, but it does go up uh, through photosynthesis. Right? Precursor for plants, algae, most likely. Some consume other organisms in areas that lack light. So algae can exist in the deep ocean where no sunlight hits. 
It doesn't need the sun. Well, some species don't need the sun, and they don't. They don't need uh, photosynthesis. Some of them are actually able to consume others. And algae. Some are certainly parasites. We know that in agriculture, certainly. Um, rust. You know, you think of your your color rust and that kind of thing. Coffee rust looks like a fungus. It's brown colored. It's not really green. That's an algae. Okay, and there's billions and billions of them on your leaf. It's not just one fungi. So if you know that, you can address that, knowing that it's not a fungi fungus, and you can address your algae issue, right? Slime molds. Ever heard of a slime mold? Kind of a new field study. Slime molds are protists that work together as like a colony, as a group. They're very fungus-like in their function and what they do and the way they act. They absorb nutrients through the cell wall just like a fungus does. They, some of them can consume other organisms and some of them are parasites. Look at some protozoa. These are the ciliated, meaning they have cilia, kind of like little hairs, showing the organelles. Yeah? Very animal-like. See the little tiny hairs it has? All the way around? Those are cilia. It's a cilia in itself, yeah. Uh -huh. Binucleated means this guy has two nucleus. What that means is, this is a protist about to split into two. <laughs> and being that this is a, it's a, it's a division, right? The yep, there you go. So it's like binary fission, just like bacteria. That one's got two nucleus, right? <coughs> they obviously look like they have an agenda, right? They're, they have a place to go, and a, like it's, it's like obvious that they're put on this planet to do something. You know, when you look at bacteria just kind of laying there, is that really doing much? It's very animal-like. Say put on this planet to do something. You're talking about creation. Now. Well, some sort of function. Yeah. What are all those things floating on or on the outside? What shape are they? They're round, round, rod shaped round. bacteria and round shaped bacteria. Protists. No. It's similar to it. Similar. This is algae. When you said it's a world amongst itself, it's kind of what I wanted to show here. Um, each, each one of those blobs of algae is like a micro ecosystem. Why? Because algae can do what? 
Okay, algae. Uh, John Bonner is a uh, pioneered slime mold study. These are videotapes he made as a graduate student. Microscopic films. The key to slime molds is remember, I said they work together. They're part of one unit, they have a single agenda, which just makes them absolutely amazing. Multiple organisms here are doing this, working together to create a structure and then reproduce. Here's a great one. Uh, it's an experiment he did, or a, a group did, based upon his stuff. They set up a maze and put a slime mold in there, put a nutrient source to the middle, and watch what happens. They start communicating with each other, and they find it. <laughs> one goes one way, one goes the other. They meet in the middle. Hey, do you see anything yet? No, keep going this direction. So very cool. See how there's almost like a pulse to it? Like when it comes out, it goes right, and then it stops, and then it goes left, and then it stops, and then it kind of does this uniform circling around. Very much communication going on there. We have no idea how it's working. <laughs> it gives a better perspective on what life that you can't see out here, and it gives it deeper meaning when you look at it in this, this, this perspective, you know? That's what I'm trying to do today. You guys want to take lunch? Yeah. All right. We'll come back and talk about the natural biological processes. Everyone's back. How long do you think? 40 minutes? Is that enough time? 45 minutes, call it?